And so, we will do biochemist review. I put up slides for coordination chemistry, electrode. I don't really want to do all that material. So I'll give you the three minute version of coordination chemistry today, and then we'll just check that box and we'll keep moving. We had a very good question about the lab practical. Usually people start paying attention to what I say. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, the question was, we, some people have received instruction that if you're using a spec, and so you're doing, making a standard curve, which means you're making a series of serial dilutions, um, and then speccing each of those for known concentrations and then known absorbances. The instructions are, if your first more concentrated samples, the instrument blinks because it's too strongly absorbing and it's so high you can't handle it. You are instructed to write that down. Write what down? I would write down like, the, if it doesn't give you a number, I would write down over for the table, because that's what the instrument is doing. It's telling you the absorbance is so high, can't even measure it. Out of range. So just write a dash or over or something just to keep track of that and keep going. You will get a choice of two wavelengths. You're not told which one to use. Either one will work. Pick one, make your dilutions, keep going, don't break out. Just, just keep going. You don't need to blank the spec between each reading. That can save you time. Or that can waste your time, I guess, if you do that. You need to blank the spec between every time you change the wavelength. So as long as you keep the wavelength the same, you blank it once, you go. What else? Same format as before, worksheet, front, back. Not that much to prep for, pretty low hazard materials, so goggles, gloves, all that good stuff, but just because that's what we do in the chem lab, and you don't know what someone contaminated the gear with last. It's not going to be your work. What else? So if it's blinking, what do we graph that as? If it's blinking, can you graph that? Nah, just don't, okay. just don't include those. Good. Um, are we doing all the same type of serial dilution? Can you say that again? Can you say that again? A serial dilution. Yeah, we're about to do the same one. Are we all doing the same ratio dilution? So are you all doing, so the question, let me read, let me try and get it, and then you can tell me if I'm getting the right question. Is everybody doing the same serial dilution, like fold? Is everyone doing a five-fold or a ten-fold or whatever? Yeah, there's only one sheet, so you'll get a different unknown, but everyone, I forget what the number is, but everyone's doing the same fold dilution. And you do it the same throughout your entire dilution. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Other stuff. You're going to be given two wavelengths, and you're going to pick one and do just that one. Okay. The great majority of people pick whichever wavelength the spec is already set to, because only the first group has to set the spec. That's fine. That will work. Uh, my advice is not to overthink it. Pick, pick one that sounds better to you and just do it. But you do not have to do both. One or the other. You have to do only one, not make some. So you will, as before, the question is about data management, I guess. Um, you will, as before, be asked to give a raw data, as before I mean it like a worksheet, I guess, or raw data, which is everything except things that aren't a number. Um, then the standard curve, where you have nibbled at the two ends until it is a pretty good straight line. You can't nibble in the middle of a line. You can't take a data point in the middle, even if it's bad. You gotta leave it. You can nibble at the very high and the very low until it's a pretty reasonable line. People ask, what R squared is good enough? There's no cutoff. You just want it to visually sort of be a reasonable line. What matters then, though, is that the absorbances that you use in your standard curve, they're, you're unknown. Your sample has to be within that range. Otherwise, your Y equals N plus B won't work for you. So you want it to be as big as possible. You want to nibble only the bare minimum to get it to be a line. You need to know any equations. I would say, I would look at the, what would we call, spectrophotometry worksheet, whatever the last one that we did. That's pretty, that's pretty much exactly what you need to know. So you need to know how to deal with Beer's Law, but you don't need to remember the Uranus equation or the Nernst equation or anything like that. Cool. 
Are you told how many dilutions to do? Yes. So if you have in the past been advised to take out a data point in the middle, I would say you're scientifically generally not supposed to do that. If you know something was wrong with it, then in the real world you would redo it. Um, I would say no. I would say you're not supposed to take out points in the middle. Um, there may be other reasons why you would do so if you knew it was an outlier statistically or you knew there was something wrong with the experiment. But I would say generally speaking, you're on the to leave the best that you get in your mind. Good question. Okay. Final exam. Is that next week? Uh, no, it's going to be okay. Uh, so we'll be in here. We'll be at the usual time. We'll be at the usual length. It will be approximately the same length of exam. Typically there are more questions, but they're shorter. Because I have to get more topics in there the whole semester. Um, but I have to set them on so they don't take all that long. you got to get it done at 85 minutes. Usual stuff. I'll give you, I guess, everything that you got for exam three. So all the equations, redox balancing, periodic table, all that good stuff. What day? Tuesday. Good question. Important question. From here on Tuesday. I have had people email me the day after and say, I forgot what it was. <laughs> Not a good email to have to respond to. But no, come on Tuesday. Yeah, no. Come on Tuesday. Please. Hmm? Passing grade? Yeah. Passing grade in 111 is a C minus, as I understand it. Um, generally speaking, I defer this to university policy because it seems to change for reasons that I can only kind of keep up with. It probably means the same for you guys. My current understanding is that a 70 is a cutoff, and that's a C minus. Discussion section. There's no more discussion. Um, there'll be office hours with me. I don't know whether that'll be it makes sense for me to do it in the office or makes sense for me to do it in the library room or whatever. But wherever it is, I'm going to know. So you know where to find me. It won't be that far away. Right? Somewhere where there's talking. Okay. Let's do some chemistry. Metal ligand coordination chemistry. We're going to condense a whole career's worth, potentially a career's worth of work, into about three minutes here, which is always fun and kind of insulting. This is what I did, nominally what I did my PhD in, so that's for me about five and a half years of work. Um, it turns out I went in doing inorganic chemistry, which is basically everything other than carbon. Um, and that is what I did. I worked with a lot of protein, some with iron, and a little bit of cobalt. Uh, largely, what I ended up doing was physical chemistry, which was the business of turning data into a straight line. Uh, and then using y equals x plus b to tell you something. But I did that with metals. Remember when we did Lewis acid base? I hope people will say yeah. That's probably going to be on the final, so you might as well review it. And hey, we might as well do that right now. What were metals? Lewis acids or Lewis bases?
Come on now. Why? What does the Lewis acid do? What is its function? Lewis acid. It accepts electrons. That's right. It's an electron pair acceptor. Metals bind with ligands. What do you think ligands are? Yeah, lose basic. So when I would draw a compound and ask you, please circle the atoms acting as Lewis acids, or please identify the atoms acting as Lewis bases, I might draw something like this. It's an iron 3 plus ion with six waters. Do you remember the geometry? The name for that? It's octahedral. <coughs> Good. Because if you make that a polygon, it then has eight features. Okay. What's the Lewis acid? Or if you call water acting as loose base, that's probably okay too. All right, you're ready for biochem. A lot of enzymes, which are proteins that are used as catalysts, use metals to help them do catalysis. The metal is the Lewis acid, and the protein, big though it may be, has atoms that have lone pairs. And act as loose bases and micro metal. There, you have metal enzymes. A couple of people were doing the practice exams, and they asked me about a word that was on them that we didn't talk about yet. So we'll do that now. What if I took iron again, and again I drew this octahedral arrangement? Let's see if I can do this. But I used the molecule catechol, which was part of your last exam. Both iron three, both have six oxygens donating lone pairs to them. A catechol, this molecule here, is doing what is called chelating. This item comes from some root, meaning to bite or to claw. Like a pincer, a pinchy crab, because it is binding the metal from more than one angle. If a ligand, if a Lewis base is binding to a metal in more than one place, it is chelating. This could also be called bidentate. Why? Why is this called bidentate? Yeah, that's right. It's biting in two places. It's like if you have an angry little dude toddler that is both biting and clawing you at the same time. I got into inorganic chemistry for two reasons. One, because almost everything you work with has a pretty color. I can not even work with now purple for some reason in my lab. It's good, it's my daughter's favorite color. And in addition to being colored, um, they have interesting 3D structures. I like thinking about non-critical structures and rotating them in my head and thinking about the 3D nature. A lot of inorganic chemistry is called that. I thought that was good.
I think the question that was on that practice final was, is this ligand chelating? Yes or no? And you would look at water. Is water chelating iron? No. Nope. It's kind of called chelating iron. Yes. And how did you know? Because it is chomp chomping in two places. Good enough. All right. Thoughts? We could go on about inorganic chemistry and ligands and orbitals and lots of things at length, because I think it's interesting, but we're not going to. <laughs> what we're going to do is have you go on to your next courses, bio to gen or nutritional science or whatever in kinesiology where you're learning about the iron uptake requirements and different bioavailability of different forms of iron, and you're going to go, the iron is the Lewis acid. And when it's being chelated, that's stable. Because Chelating ligands tend to be more stable than not chelating ligands. That's, that's where we're going to go on. For now. If you want to know more, come talk to me because I go on about this all day long. All day long. Not all night long, though, because then we go home. All right. Coordination chemistry? Chapter 24. Check. I mean, not really, but that's what we're going to do. Okay, now we do biochem. So we got, you know, not quite an hour today, and then we got Thursday to do review, as I see it. We will take issues and portions of biochemistry and dig through them for all the chapters that we did in Chem 111. So I'm going to kind of run through it today to see what we find in here. Let me know what you want to do for Thursday. When you look at your exams and you say, Kind of like solubility. Can we do that? Or I kind of like buffers, but I wish that I got a better. Can we do that. Let me know, and we'll do whatever you guys want to do on Thursday through this lens. So today I have electrochemistry of respiration versus photosynthesis, organic chemistry of fermented yeah, fermented beverages, and Thanksgiving. Let's see how far we get. Ah, there's a bunch of words on that slide. For aerobic respiration at a reasonable body temperature, something like 37 degrees Celsius, delta G, I guess that should be naught. No, it's not naught because it's at body temperature. Delta G is negative 2,880 kilojoules per mole. Per mole of glucose for the overall reaction as pictured. Glucose plus oxygen is in equilibrium with CO2, water, and heat. That's like the first reaction we ever did in Chem 111 when we were doing rates. Back about 200 learning outcomes ago. Which atoms are oxidized and which are reduced? <coughs> mm. Well, how will you know? How do you know the difference between oxidation and reduction? Yeah, I see it. Leo here. What were you going to say? Assign oxidation states. That's how you will know what changed. Exactly right. C. I don't know yet. Let me come back to that. That's okay. Oxidation state for H. Plus one. Yeah, typically plus one. Ooh. Not very good. What about O? Negative two. Yeah, negative two. Oh ho! But I have 12 H's, so that's 12 times a plus 1. And I have 6 O's, that's 6 times a negative 2. So, so far I have plus 12, a minus 12, and I have to get it all to add up to 0. zero. That's right, because glucose is neutral. So, what's the average oxidation state of those 6 carbons? 0. Cool. <coughs>
Kind of weird. Glucose has the same carbon oxidation state as graphite. Glucose and a pencil are pretty different. Uh, then we got six O2s. Oxygen, any element by itself with no charge. Zero. Right. Now we got CO2. Work with it enough, you'll remember this one. But each O is a negative two, so that means carbon has to be. Yeah, plus four. And then water. Everybody behaving themselves, so we got a plus one and a minus two. And heat is an, is energy, but it's not a chemical, so I don't need to worry about that. Okay, so we've assigned oxidation states. We don't have any metals, which we often do in electric chemistry, but here we go. Organic electric chemistry is a thing. So what changed? Carbon. Carbon and oxygen. And oxygen. Good. And which oxygen? Well, some of it went from minus 2 to minus 2, but some of it went from 0 to minus 2, so we'll do that one. Got a 50 50 shot here. Multiple guess, whatever they call it. Carbon is. Carbon is oxidized. Good. Charge goes up. Oxygen is reduced. Charge goes down. Charge is reduced. That's how I think about it. But a lot of different ways to do it. Good. Oxygen is the oxidant. Glucose is a fuel. Questions, thoughts? All right. Now flip it around. Which molecules act as oxidizing agents? And which act as reducing agents? Now we're talking about molecules, not atoms. We're talking about agents. For agents, I would look at the reactants. That is true if you're going backwards, but I would look at the reactants. So oxygen is the oxidizing agent. O2 is the oxidizing agent. I agree, because it is being reduced. Once you have one, you have the other. So which molecule is the reducing agent? Glucose. Glucose. I like semicolons, so let's use one there. What I think you need, and I could be wrong, what I think you need is one way that you can talk yourself through how to get these right. And it could be different. One of the things that's challenging is that that way might be different for different people. If you are still searching for a way where you, individually, on an exam, by yourself, not looking at your neighbor's exam, can identify these correctly, let me know. I can help. Or ask people who can help you. What is E naught cell? Wait. How am I? How am I supposed to do that? Nick. Nick asks, "Would you use the delta G in the temperature?" Well, I guess I would. I guess I would. In what equation?
What equation has both delta G and E cell in it? Hmm? Um, it's actually what I would pre-NERST. NERST doesn't have delta G in it directly. I would use delta G equals negative NFE. So in this case, you don't even necessarily need the temperature. It's convenient. Um, I have delta G. F is a constant. Uh, I don't have N though. Oh dear. Am I going to get N? Yeah, if you had the balanced half reactions, you could do it. This reaction is already balanced, so I don't need to go through that process per se. What I can do is look at the oxidation state change and see how many times it happened. Let's look at carbon. It should be the same for both, but carbon went from zero to plus four. How many times? Six times. So it changed by four electrons six times. Six times four. 24. N is 24. So I'll bring that down here. But you set up your delta G equals negative NFE, plug in your N. There it is, constant. What am I doing wrong here? Volt. Volt electrons. So I got my N from six carbons that each changed by four electrons. And you can do this in any equation you get. Sometimes you're looking at a metal complex that you might do by the half reaction method, sometimes not. But you want to see how many oxidation state changed and how many times. That gives you the number of electrons. Eight eight oh 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 negative divided by negative twenty four. Hmm. <laughs> good question. Should it be two sig figs? No. I think three. Based on the delta G. What? Would you get docked if you only use two sig figs? No, by the rule that I set, you're allowed to be within one of the correct number of sig figs. In this case, that's probably pretty soft. So I would have to give you full credit, but I would shake my fist at it. But yeah, you would. So 24 electrons, I would say it does not have two sig figs. That is a quantity. That is a number of electrons. It's not 24.2 electrons. Is the reaction spontaneous as written? Yes. Yeah. Burning fuel is spontaneous. And you using food to create life and things in your body is spontaneous. And that's good. 
Very good. How did I know the reaction was spontaneous as written? Yeah, delta G is negative, or you can do E is positive. I go with go with delta. I do the same thing. I go with delta G. <laughs> Questions? Thoughts so far? Pardon. Sorry. These reactions weren't spontaneous. What would it look like if these reactions weren't spontaneous? Next slide. We'll tell you. Excellent lead-in. So we'll get there in a minute. Very good. Do you expect the redox potential to be pH dependent? What do you look for? OH. Yeah, go to the balanced equation and look for H plus or OH minus. Because that is how pH is measured. Concentration of H+. Are those in the overall balance equation? No. This is probably good because it means that as your body pH might fluctuate a little bit with various conditions or temperatures, respiration still works. So that's a good, that's a good thing. Yeah, thumbs up. Thumbs up, respiration. So if there's no H plus or OH minus in the overall balanced reaction, pH cannot possibly affect it because it's, it's not there. There are other ways pH could affect it, but by the equation it can. What is N for the reaction that's written? Well, I don't know why I put that question later because we already had to do that to get the cell voltage. So going back to pH, does when I'm looking at that, does H plus or OH minus need to be on the product side? No. No, it does not. It can be in either the reactants or the products because when you do products over reactants for equilibrium, no, it's a good question. When you do products over reactants for either K or for Q, both products and reactants show up. So in either place it will be, it will show up in K or Q products over reactants. That then determines how it affects it, but, that, but if it shows up at all, it will depend on pH. Lead into the next question. What is E cell without the NOD for 1 millimolar glucose, 3.8 millimolar? Uh, this one looks like a bunch of work. So let's not do it. But let's set it up. I see E cell without the NOD. I see concentrations that are not 1 molar. I will use what equation? Nernst with Q in it. That's right, the form of the Nernst that has Q in it. Chemists like molar, every time you titrate something, nearly every time, it will typically be 0.1 molar as your titrate, at least at first. This is convenient. Most things in biology are not that concentrated. You use millimolar, micromolar, nanomolar. If you're doing an equilibrium constant, at least in the strict chemistry sense, everything has to be in molar. So you have to take those millimolar and convert them to molar. Not so bad, I do remember to do it. Uh, and then do products of reactants, coefficients as exponents, and then you, that's Q, and then you go and you plug in, you do a bunch of calculator work.
As the reaction progresses, will other chemicals in the area get more concentrated or more dilute? One of Geltz's favorite questions. Well, what do you use to dilute chemicals with in biology? Yeah, water. Water. So look for water in the balanced equation. It's a product. So you generate water by respiring. I think this is neat. You exhale CO2. We're okay with that. Your exhalation has some moisture in it, so that just comes from running. That's actually generated by burning glucose. I think that's cool. By burning glucose, you are sort of hydrating yourself. I think that's cool. Which, I mean, I don't really understand. I think it's neat. So, locally, you're diluting things. You're generating water. It's as if you were adding water to the system. Why? Because water is produced. So we mostly did electrochemistry there. We did some voltage, we did some counting electrons, we did some oxidation reduction, labeling. Did a little bit of equilibrium, not a whole lot. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Chris. If you if you had OH on both sides, what would that tell you about the pH? Well, I would I would cancel it if it were on both sides. Um, so in a balanced equation, you will drop it out. Maybe it's not drop out to zero, but you want after canceling everything, after all the cleanup you can do, that's when you ask that question. Because beforehand, you will sometimes get it and sometimes confuse yourself. So if you're balancing and you end up with a second to last step that looks like this, I will say, ah, I need to do some cleanup. I got hydroxide on both sides. So basically do all the cleanup, all the canceling you can before you start trying to ask yourself questions about what will happen in the reaction, would be my general advice. My advice to you. Now, what happens if we run respiration backwards? It would be non-spontaneous. It would require the input of energy in the form of light. Photosynthesis is so cool because it takes light energy and turns it into chemical energy. Synthesis via photons. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think it's cool. Exact same reaction backwards. So here you can we can run through all these questions. I mean, it's basically the same set of questions, so we don't need to do these. But you can take a reaction in biology. You can flip it around and find some other organism. Probably does that reaction backwards. Sometimes they need an energy input. Sometimes they need a chemical input. Chemosynthetic microbes live in a place where they derive energy from unusual sets of chemistry. Strongly acid areas. Very, very hot areas. undersea volcanoes where it is shockingly hot for life to be found. And then there's little crustacean dudes that feed on those microbes and then there's whole ecosystems and tube worms and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, those are, those are crazy because their biology is completely different. Um, and even what I think of as normal crustaceans, like lobsters and things like that, some of them don't use iron as an oxygen carrier in their blood. Even though they respire, they use copper. Weird. 
I don't know that much about those. I just know it's a thing. Are there sharks that live next to volcanoes? That I do not know about. Is copper blood a different color than iron blood? Yep. Look it up. It's cool. Look up copper oxygen carriers or something like that. In crusta- I think it's crust- pretty sure it's crustacean blood, but maybe it's other inverts. All right, so what do we got here? We got more electrochemistry. We got K. Yeah. Fermentation. It's getting to be finals time. Yeah, so fermentation is spontaneous, as is respiration. But look at the delta G. So respiration, delta G was... Compare respiration with fermentation. Now, if you're brewing beer, those brewers' yeast, same yeast for making bread, just different strains, uh, would rather respire. If they have oxygen, they will respire. If they run out of oxygen, then they will ferment. Why would they rather respire? Yeah, because they get more energy out of it. That's right, it's more spontaneous. They would rather respire, use oxygen to do the dirty work of oxidizing a fuel because it is more spontaneous. So they get more fuel. They get about 10 times more energy out of it before all the inefficiencies of life happen. Yeah, kind of neat. Uh, Okay, same idea. So you can do the same calculations for this. Um, This basically is how I set up the final exam. I try and pick a molecule or a theme. One year the theme was oxyclean which is a fascinating chemical. And we did the whole final based on that. Electrochemistry, thermodynamics, kinetics, everything. One year it was CO2, we did water. Um, this year maybe, maybe we'll do food. Maybe we'll do caffeine, I don't know. What do you guys want to do? So we discussed doing uh, deadly things for the final. That was one suggestion. We could do that. We could do happy molecules. Dopamine and yeah. Serotonin. I don't know. Let's talk about flavor. Here are three molecules. Please identify functional groups that you see, and then please give a chemical formula. Let's give a chemical pick, pick one and do the chemical formula. You don't need to go on because you get the idea. Functional groups is the task here, and then can you recognize what's a C, what's an H, things like that. Um, I typically get a question about the squiggly line in that isohumulone in the middle. That is a single bond. What the squiggly line means is it can be either forward or backward, and then you don't know until you look at it. I think. Let's go with that. So let's identify functional groups. This is a good set of molecules for that. We got lots of functional groups.
Oh, we have so many functional groups here. Who would like to draw some functional groups? Organic chemistry? Yeah. Who else wants to draw functional groups? Who would like to draw, circle, and name some functional groups here? Matt, you want to draw Let's see, what color should we give him? Purple. Purple. Well, I don't know where purple is. Where's purple? There. Just pick the ones. This is the key to going first. You get to do the ones you know. All the ones that I know? Do they? Well, I'll pick something. Whatever you want to do. I misspelled that terribly. I can't Matthew has identified that the OH at the alcohol. bottom of the vanilla is an alcohol group. Correct. Failing miserably at spelling. That's okay, we know what you mean. There's an O, and it's got carbons on either side. It's so bad it's memorable. Exactly. Never so bad you'll never know. Aha! Now, we're going to have to agree to disagree. Or maybe you'll change your mind. Because this is a C double bond O. On one side is a carbon, and on the other side is an H. Oh. That's an aldehyde. Oh. Yep. Uh, I don't know what the erase button is. Just scratch it out. <coughs> aldehyde. The way I do these when I'm given an exam with a whole bunch of molecule with a ridiculous number of molecules, is I start with the C double bond O's. I find all the C double bond O's and I say, let me do those first before I worry about what's an alcohol and what's the ether and all the rest of them. That's been a good strategy. All right, so we got an aldehyde. <coughs> I do see some ketones in the isocumulone. Probably where the bone comes from in the name. There's a ketone. This carbon, carbon, and then the C double bond O. And I see I'm thinking two more ketones. Do you, do you want me to circle all of them? Sure. Circle up some ketones. Ketone, ketone. Ketone. <laughs> and I think this is carbo carboxylic acid. That is a carboxylic acid. Good. C double bond O and the OH right next to it. Carboxylic acid. I apologize for my crappy handwriting. There's no apologies in 111. Just keep going. Um. It's an al alcohol. Yep. If I'm missing any, I, I apologize, but I think that's no it. Right. Good, thank you. Woo. Yay. Yay. That's an alcohol. Carboxylic acid, alcohol, carboxylic acid is in malic acid. Well, it's aptly named because it's an acid. Isohumulone, we got some of those functional groups. We got three ketones, but I see two alcohols. And then I see one more functional group. Yeah, alkenes. So here's one, two, three. Kind of a mess, but you get the idea. <laughs> Functional groups. Chemical formula, let's do malic acid. I got C's, I got H's, I got O's. Let's do O first, because those have to be explicitly written out. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I just got partial credit. Always take the points you can get, no apologies. How many carbons? One, two, three, four. Good. Ah, now the H's. Let's redraw this down here.
I miss any? I think I got them. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six H's. C4, H6, O5. And that is the task. Questions, thoughts, recommendations about functional groups and drawing to a chemical formula? If you take environmental chemistry lab with me, you will do an octanol water partition coefficient lab. It's a bunch of words. What that means is that you will take a molecule and see whether it is more soluble in water or in octanol. All right. Let's draw water. I can do that one. It says with lone pairs. All right. All right. What uh, one octanol? What should I do? A squiggle with how many squiggles? I need eight carbons. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. And then an alcohol group where? At the end. Which end? Doesn't matter. Correct. And that needs two lone pairs. Draw them wherever you like. O okay. That's all that was asked of me. What do you see when you look at octanol? Yeah, pretty big chain, relatively big chain. One polar functional group at the end, so it has lone pairs. When you do an octanol water partition coefficient, one way to quantify it, does your molecule like polar environments or non-polar environments? Why would you do that? If you have a chemical that's released to the environment and you want to know how it will be absorbed by organisms, you say, will it stay in water or will it, is it fat soluble? So you do this with vitamins too. Will it be absorbed into a creature's fatty tissue or will it stay in the water and be excreted more rapidly? If the alcohol is oxidized to a carboxylic acid group, what would I draw? Eight carbons, but what do I draw at the end now? Well, what's a car? Yeah, a carboxylic acid. What does that look like? Correct. Double bonded O, and then an OH. What does that look like as far as the biomolecules go? Lipid. It isn't necessarily a lipid per se, but it starts to look like that. Polar end chain. Yep, good. Those stay the same on the final. So those are the four you need to know. Carbs, lipids, amino acids, and nucleic acids. What would actually constitute that? What? What would actually constitute What would, what would make that into an, a legitimate lipid? Wouldn't a phosphate group at the end? Okay. Probably with another chain. Two chains of phosphate. Okay. Would be the most common thing. This would be a fatty acid because it has a long chain, which is fat, basically, and then an acid at the end, fatty acid. So that could be part of it a little bit, I guess. That could be part of like a triglyceride. Okay. They say tryptophan makes you tired. That's not true. Tryptophan is an amino acid. I don't know why this has been associated with turkey. Somebody started this. It's a really common amino acid. It's in lots of foods. It's the, the three bottles of wine you drink so that you could talk to your distant relatives. That's what makes you tired. Just saying. What class of biomolecules is tryptophan in? Amino acid. 
Yeah, it's amino acid. How did you know? Well, one, I spent all that time making a flashcard. I remember that that's a W, maybe. Um, but it's, it has an amine group right next to a carboxylic acid group, and that's an amino acid. What kind of functional groups do you see? Yeah, I mean, well, it's got to have an amine and an acid. I see two more. Yeah, alkene. Is what? So an N that's got a proton and H, and then it's got two carbons. What is that? Nah. Not O. It's an amine. Still an amine. An amine can have any combination needed of H's and C's attached to it. It's got to have three of them. And it can have whatever you need. In this case, it's two C's and an H. Draw in hydrogens and lone pairs. Oh, man. Okay, I gotta make sure all carbons have four bonds. Okay, so that I think is all the H's. All the carbons now have four bonds. All the H's that are on other atoms, anything but carbon, have to be drawn in. They have to be given to you first bond. So your task is to look at carbons. And then how do we put the lone pairs on? Yeah, I look for right side of the periodic table, the ones that are loaded up on lone pairs. So oxygen will have two. How many lone pairs for nitrogen? Just one. And then hybridization. What am I looking for? Yeah, some people look for double and triple bonds. It's probably the most direct. The double bond and it takes away a P orbital. The triple bond has to take away two P orbitals to do that. Um, I think about the number of directions electrons go. You want to get you there. If it's got a double bond, in this case it will be SP2. Double bonded carbon and sp3. Otherwise, sp3. Um, do you remember the hybridization refers to the atom, not the bond. So that's referred to carbon or an oxygen or something like that rather than the bond. Enzymes. An enzyme is a protein that is a catalyst. Who would like to draw an energy diagram for a spontaneous reaction? People start shaking their head before I even finish the question. That's okay. That's why I asked. Yeah. Spontaneous reaction. Forward direction. Forward direction. Forward spontaneous reaction. Cool. Why is it spontaneous? Because the products are lower in energy. Good. Now, please draw that again, except catalyzed.
Okay, cool. What's the same and what's different? So activation energy is different. The, the vertical distance from the reactants to the top of the hill is different. That's what a catalyst does. Reactants and products, they stay the same. Thank you. Activation energy, the forward uncatalyzed reaction. And the activation energy, the forward catalyzed reaction. For enzymes, often these activation energies are really, 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 really different. Because often they're helping you do a reaction that otherwise is not likely to happen. Oh. That's why they're there, exactly right. To help you get it done. <coughs> Does an enzyme change the spontaneity of a current reaction? Spontaneity is products minus reactants, it's delta G. Enzyme does not change whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. It just changes whether kinetically it will happen on your lifetime. Which is better, because it's an enzyme that's related to your lifetime. Good. Here's the reaction. Hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is one of the not too common cases where oxygen has an oxidation state that is not 2 minus. There are not too many of them. This is one. Uh, if you buy peroxide from CVS, you buy it as 3% peroxide in water. Um, the stuff you have in your cabinet is no longer 3%. Because it degrades over time. Luckily, it doesn't degrade to anything bad. It degrades to water and oxygen. So the oxygen leaves and the water is water. If it's already in water, so okay, no problem. It doesn't work as well as peroxide, but that's okay. It doesn't hurt you at least. So let's balance this before we go too much further. This is redox. We could use the half reaction method, but I bet we can do this by eye. What coefficients do I need here? <laughs> People racing to make it look like they're not raising their hands. What do you got, Carter? Yeah, I think I think that's right. So now we got four hydrogens and four hydrogens. We have four oxygens and two plus two is four oxygens. Beautiful, great. Here's what I like about chemistry. Here is a balanced reaction. I gave you some background into relating this with CBS, which is the type of story I tell. But what I like about chemistry is that you can pick pretty much any reaction ever and look at every chapter of Chem 111 about that reaction or about that molecule. That, for most people, either you think that's cool and you stay in chemistry, or you find that really annoying and you go do something else. Either one is okay, but what this means is that we can do a theme finder. I can pick a molecule and do almost everything. We can look at interactions with cell walls and with antioxidants. That would be biomolecules. Cell walls are made of lipids. They get oxidized by this. We could look at orbital hybridization for oxygen. I don't know why, but yeah, sp3, sp3, sp2 for these different molecules. We could look at electrochemistry, because this has a cell voltage. We could look at the equilibrium, and we could look at delta G. All of these themes and all of these skills and these chemistry concepts are essentially independent of the molecule and the reaction. That's why they're useful. Because you can go do biochemistry, you can go do kinesiology, you can go do marine science. 
Equilibrium is constant, it's still products over reactants, no matter where you are. Here's a plot. I have in the past actually put this plot on the final exam. Probably I won't this time because I said that. I think it's in one of the practice finals. Here's a plot of the natural log of absorbance, but you can see in the caption, this is the natural log LN of the concentration of peroxide versus time. Time is in the x-axis. What is the reaction order? Oh, I gave you very little information. I just threw up a graph I photoshopped out of some paper and asked them what the reaction order was. First order, why? Because it's plotted as a natural log. So how did, it, how did you know that makes it first order? Because this is the type of question where you might plot it three different ways and see what's a straight line. So the other way to think about this is first order integrated rate law, which you may remember the name for, but you don't have to to get this, it is the natural log of concentration at time t equals negative k t plus the natural log of the initial concentration. Hey, look at what x and y are. Yep, that's what you do. So many people develop the reflex when they see natural log. They, they put it on first order. And then people wake up when I do that in class. Um, that's typically right. You need to look a little bit closer, but that's, that's typically right. So you will look at the integrated rate laws, which I always give on the equation sheet. And I always give them the same order, but I'll tell you what they are. And then the first order one is natural log, so there you go. That's what an enzyme looks like. There are so many atoms in many of these enzymes, you can't even draw them because it would be noise, it would be unintelligible. So you draw these beautiful ribbons and lines to represent curves and beta sheets and alpha helices and all these things that you'll learn if you go to biochem. I, they're quite pretty, I think. Mean, um, what I don't like about it is that a lot of chemical information is lost. So there, you don't know where the lone pairs are. You don't know where the metals are. So you gotta dig a little bit deeper to know more chemistry in there. We will deal with this next time. In the meantime, please send me what you wanna do. So I definitely wanna do some acid base and some buffers. Send me what else you wanna do and we'll get it done on Thursday. Thanks, y'all. See you soon.